I piss as much as I can. It's too cold. I know that it keeps you warm, right? At least that. No, it's terrible. Then I hope you're rinsing your wetsuit every time. That I do, but that's why my gear lasts for yeah. ever. I mean, I've got a 5.4 from 2016 that's still perfect. Well, certainly not perfect, but it still works. I rinse my stuff, including surfboard, every time. Yes. I have to. It's my board. I've gotten lazy from leaving close to my house because I can just drive right back and get the hot shower without even taking it off. And just like, and that's just, nice. Every time. You know what I noticed today, though? When I got home, I had two massive things in my board. One in my tail, one in my nose. I don't know how I did it. So now I got to get it fixed. So your kids start riding your shit and they bring it back and they just put it back on the rack and then you go to use it the next time. And you're like, what the hell is this? <laughs> what happens to that? It's like two inches shorter. What do you mean? You didn't notice. <laughs> Huge crunch in one, my fish and my daughter are like, I don't know. I didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. All right. You did see, I did see like when I was left my house, kind of that South Toro zone, I saw some wedgie just perfect ones in there but then crappy ones all over too yeah oh yeah a lot of times there you just have to be lucky so lucky yeah all the time yeah be lucky one guy one guy was trying at cheney and there was like five guys at montecito and that was it it was pretty looked pretty bad yeah how about you pat you get out this morning yeah yeah i got a little um nothing i'm down in south county so i'm here and i live in pismo and so I just ran to the reefs out here and, and uh, it was fun. It was, it was clean and I, I've surfed here since I was, gosh, fifth grade. My, my buddy's mom used to drop us off at the beach with boards and like, off you go kids. Nice. Uh, I just, I know all those little spots, the tides, all the little funny things, subtleties. Yeah. So yeah, I got some really fun ones though. Nice. Little south, little, little north combo and, and, uh, yeah, some good ones. All right. Okay. Cool. Sorry, guys. We had a one little quick technical difficulty there. It it was trying to say it wasn't going to go live on Facebook, but it looks like we are live on Facebook. Yes. All right. All right. Cool. Uh, let's start looking at. Oh, we already have people chatting at us. Stephen, Martha, Hewitt stalking us again from Columbus. Thank you for joining us again. Really appreciate it. Let's see. We've got a few many people on already. Looking at, right. looks like Peachy's on a couple times over. <laughs> Helen, Helen is joining us again from Baltimore. What's up? And a few Casey, Matt Allen. Hey, Matt Allen. Speaking of Pismo, there's there's that dude. He's on, right on. And who else? Cool. How do I see people again? Do I go to the Q and A down at the bottom? Yeah, so you go to, to participants and then chat, and then that'll put it over on the right for you, and then you can see who's on and who might be uh, um, wanting to ask a question or something like that. So participants or Q and A? Uh, both. They'll both. They'll join. They they do a split window over onto the right. Gotcha. Yeah. I can't figure it out right now, but that's all right. I've, I've got technical. Difficulties, or I'm just slightly <laughs> technically challenged. <laughs> All right, so, let's see. Waterlogged brain. Yeah, as long as I don't lose a bunch of water out of my nose <laughs> during this thing, we're good. <laughs> you ever do that on your keyboard? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lean over, like, oh no. <laughs> There's a bunch of people watching right now, going, "What in God's name are they talking about?" <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, we're good to go. We're at five after, so let's get this going. All right. Uh, <clears throat> all right, Han. So welcome, everyone, to another one of our Paso Wine Hangouts. Uh, so thanks so much for joining us. So many of you have been joining us over this time period, and we really appreciate it. Maybe some of you are new to it, and uh, welcome. Uh, this is basically a hangout. We have a, we kind of day drink. We, we have a glass of wine. We talk about a subject. It's loosely tied to Paso wine and Paso wine making. Uh, sometimes it's entirely tied to it. Uh, today is one of the, the, the former. Uh, today we're gonna be talking about 
how the art and kind of science, if you will, of surfing uh, kind of matches up to the art science of uh, winemaking. I've got three winemakers on who are surfers. Uh, sounds like most of us got to surf this morning, maybe. Uh, and uh, we are going to talk a little bit about that. What's the correlation? How does that work? Uh, we've got Josh Beckett from Peachy Canyon Winery. We've got Philip Funder from Lot Wine, Estate Wines and Patrick Moran from Niner Wine Estates. Yes. Um, I want to first uh, and very briefly introduce them. Well, I have introduced them. I should say first let them introduce themselves and their brands and a little bit about themselves. And then we'll kind of get right back into the topic. So Josh, I'd like to start with you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. Josh Beckett, Peachy Canyon Winery. Um, family owned, second generation. Brand, Peachy Canyon started in 1988, a little winery called Tobias before that, and uh, historically been kind of a focus on Z Red Zinfandel. We, today I'm sharing with the boys a little GSM, a little dry farm to state GSM, which is kind of cool. We're definitely changing up some of the portfolio uh, as my brother and I, second generation, come on. But yeah, welcome everybody. Yes. Um, raised mm -hmm. the Central Coast, surfed the Central Coast whole night, my whole life. Honestly, St. Patrick, though, I'm holding out to never surf the reefs in Shelby. <laughs> I'm just sticking to it now that I've waited this long. So, but yeah. Yeah. thanks. I'll drag There's you some down. Gems there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pat, uh, why don't you go next, bud? Yeah, so Patrick Moran, winemaker at Niner Wine Estates. Um, Niner Wine Estates is on the west side of Pass Robles, there, uh, family owned and operated. Second generation as well with uh, Andy Niner uh, at the helm. Uh, we grow, we have three estate vineyards, uh, two in Paso Robles and one in Edna Valley. Uh, focus on Bordeaux varieties, but we also make uh, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay from the Edna Valley, uh, amongst others. And it's kind of a nice, uh, nice outfit. Been there, like I said, 10 years, and it's a, it's a great family to, to work for and be a part of. You're saying that because Andy's watching, right? No. This, this is my script. <laughs> I was given by our PR TV, you know. No, I just, uh, it is, it's, it's awesome. You know, like I said, how, how can you complain? I went surfing this morning and went to work, worked for a while. Now I'm socializing, talking about uh, two of my favorite things. So, yeah. Uh, Philip, you're up next. But. Um, hi, I'm Philip. I'm the winemaker at Law Estate. Uh, First generation, uh, Don and Susie Lahr are the owners, but we're on the Western Hills of Paso Robles, one of the highest elevated vineyards um, in the area. I think second only to Dow. Our highest blocks are um, right around 1900 feet. It's all estate grown, um, all organically farmed. And philosophy in the winery for me is, is pretty similar to that. Um, I don't use any yeast, anything like that. It's all completely native ferments. And I kind of, I think we've got such an incredible terroir and, um, and you know, hillside and these vineyards that we all have on the Western side of Paso Robles that I just really want to express what's there without messing with it too much. And um, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful place. I've been here since 2016 and looking forward to many, many more years, so. So like I had said, we're doing this uh, topic about how surfing and wine kind of blend uh, in, a, in a way or how they might influence each other as these guys are all surfers uh, and winemakers. Um, and honestly, it, it's, it's kind of a grasp, right? I mean, maybe let's admit it. I just felt like having a chat about surfing <laughs> while on the clock. <laughs> but in actuality, though, it does become... Um, kind of part of you. It influences a lot of maybe your critical thinking and how you approach challenges, maybe even some creative solutions or, or, or some original ideas. Uh, and so that's where I think it probably does kind of come into play in what it is that you do as a winemaker. And that's why I've in, uh, in, encouraged these guys uh, to come on uh, today and, and talk about it a little bit about it. Um, we also have a few wines that we're uh, tasting of each other's, of course. And so really quickly, I want to share that up. Um, so we've got the Peachy Canyon GSM, um, Philip, the Law. What are we drinking from Law? That's Aspire. So that is a blend of 86% uh, Syrah and 14% Grenache. Um, 
and the first vintage of it. So that was my first vintage at law, 2016. And um, came up with the idea of creating that wine because we had an incredible yield from some of our Syrah blocks in 16. So we just had this extra Syrah basically and didn't want to, we were trying to find a home for it in our existing blends. Um, when Scott Holly and I were blending and Scott was the head winemaker um, here at law back then in 2016. And it just, you know, all the other SKUs didn't look like themselves with extra Syrah in them. So we thought, hey, let's, you know, what, why don't we make the counterpart to a wine that we already make, which is beguiling, which is 85, 15 Grenache and Syrah, roughly every year, you know, those percentages change a little bit, but um, yeah, ended up blending it out and trying it out and absolutely loved it. The critics have loved it. Um, you know, we've got some pretty amazing scores on that wine for our first vintage of it. So it's here to stay. I'm making it every year from now on, so. Cool. Well, okay. So you're talking, let's talk a little bit about the topic. Let's go with you. Oh, yeah. I mean, how, I mean, so just so everyone knows, uh, Philip and I had a surf this morning, uh, yep. kind of fun. We talked a little bit, but you know, but I do want to start with you though, to say, I mean, how are you finding your newest here? You're new to the central coast. How is this central coast, this surfing experience helping you as you are starting to kind of create your wines and, and, and your vision of what Paso is? Yeah, well, I think surfing kind of helps me personally and on a professional level in a lot of ways. Um, surfing, we all know this for us as surfers, it's, it's much more than a sport. It's, it's a lifestyle. It's what you do. It's what you think about when you wake up in the morning. And it's, it's, it's truly, it becomes a part of you. Um, you take surfing away from me, I'm pretty sure I would wither away and die. But um, as far as winemaking goes, I think the biggest connection for me is the fact that I kind of approach a vintage or a wine or the whole process of making wine similarly to surfing in the sense that every wave is going to be different. I mean, even if you're sitting on the most mechanical of Indonesian reef breaks, they're not all identical. You know, you have to approach every wave with uh, as pretty much a completely blank slate. It's, it's a white canvas and the lines that you draw on that wave are, you know, what you feel is the right thing to do at the moment. And I feel like winemaking is very similar in that sense because I approach every single vintage as a completely blank slate and, an, and a white canvas. Um, it's never gonna be exactly the same as the vintage before or the vintage that's to follow. So approaching it in that way, I think really helps. I think surfing forces you to live in the present, in the now. You have to react to the environment, you have to react to the ocean um, because that's our playing field. It's ever changing. And it's similar in winemaking. You've got a vintage that'll never be the same. Uh, you know, Syrah might look different in 16 than it does in 17 and 18 and it comes off at different times. So I think just the fact that surfing teaches you to live in the moment really helps with winemaking because in order to make great wine, you have to live in that moment and you have to make those decisions right then. You can't, there's no formula. There's no, there's no recipe, you know? So I think that's really how surfing helps me the most when it comes to, to winemaking. Josh and Pat, you guys are totally nodding like an agreement. Like, did no, that's a good stuff. I mean, that's a great formulation because and just like Philip, I, you know, I spent some time out uh, this morning and I was thinking about this question and I was like, okay, where are the parallels? What's the overlap? And, um, and I was, I was considering it both from a scientific, you know, state, like, okay, you got surfing, you have the science of surfing. Like we looked all at the tide, swell direction, the, uh, the wind direction, you know, temperature, if you've got wetsuit choices, you know, everything, booty choices, whatnot, you know, so we, we kind of think of the, the, um, do the calculation on all of the natural influences and stuff like that. And there's a, a science to it and you can go to the science of surfboards and rocker and, you know, fin selection and everything else. Um, and, and likewise, wine has, you know, that foundational uh, aspect of, of science. It grounds you into the, uh, the facts, um, but then you have the art form of it, and that, that's where it becomes fluid. That's where it becomes creative. Like, like Philip was saying, you know, in surfing, like you are in the moment. Like you're not thinking about other things as you're taking off on a wave. Like, 
you're not thinking about your honeydew list or anything like that. You're kind of going, all right, I'm going and, and you have to dance. You have to be right there. If you're not like, you're going to miss yeah. that, uh, that step. And, uh, and so, you know, living in the moment is certainly one of them in winemaking. It is the same way. You have to be fluid. Things are coming at you so fast, both in surfing and in winemaking, certainly during harvest, you know, you're trying to do calculus on so many things that are coming at you quick. Um, you do have to, uh, kind of, dance with it as opposed to like you know, a microprocessor and, and do all the yeah. calculations instantly. It's a, it's a little more fluid at times. So I think yeah. it's, I think it's a yeah. fair argument. Uh, so I was, I was texting with Josh this morning pretty early. It was like 5:45. I left my house and I think I had already got, got a text from him. It was like, how's it looking? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I was running a little late. <laughs> and, but and then he, he's like, well, I don't know. I don't know if I'll make it because I got to get a crew over to Kyler. And so at the same time that surfing has this influence, maybe in that winemaking, surfing and winemaking don't really actually go together. You got to be up early for both, typically, right? I mean, there's so many of these factors yeah. that end up taking you, if anything, away from it. And I don't know, Josh, you didn't, you didn't end up getting in the water this morning, but did you make it to that crew? <laughs> I got pulled away. I didn't get to, and, you know, and going to, you know, spinning off even more of what you said, like our best season is our best season during it's harvest time. Yeah. So that, I think the biggest, the hardest part is when you know, because when the winery starts and the fruit starts and the ferment start, you know, it's go time. Yeah. You're there. You just, you know, it's good, but you're like, yeah, but it's not happening. Yeah. Um, but it, you know, that is what it is, but that's a good part. You know, that's, you know, that's our world here on the central coast. And there's a lot of wine regions around the world that are the best um, surf regions as well, which, you know, from Australia to Europe to, you know, South Africa, and, which is makes it really special. But, and then you even fine tune it, you know, when I was thinking about it today and this morning when I wasn't surfing as I drove by and came over the hill and, you know, you start to even take it even further from what Philip and Patrick said, even spin it off into the vineyards. Like I got pulled to the vineyard this morning, but that's kind of, I was thinking you can, you know, we correlate our kind of go-to vineyards or our go-to blocks within vineyards to specialty surf spots. Like I know this surf spot that what it's going to do, what it's going to provide to me kind of on a day-to-day -day basis, my basis, my go-to place, kind of like a certain vineyard or a certain block within a vineyard. Like I know I can really count on this, but then there's those kind of misto sites, like or a vineyard that you're maybe going to try and don't really know it, but I want to get out there and give it a taste or put my, you know, tip my, dough, my toe in the water and you might try that fruit for a season. I'm like, ah, it didn't work. Or, oh yeah, I'm stoked on it. I can't wait for that to happen again. <laughs> um, so there's that, you know, that correlation. Then I was also thinking, you know, on a winemaking front where, you know, we like to change things up, you know, we, to get better, we like to get more creative with native ferments, or we like to get more creative extended or cold soaks or concrete or, and that kind of goes back into the board thing as well. Like, I think if we change up boards, if we're writing a standard thruster, standard trifin all the time, we get stagnant and none of us want to do that in winemaking either. We want to try new things. We want to get creative. We want to do code ferments. We want to get on a single fin or get on a log or get on a, you know, and then that's when the best of the best comes out. The best surfer doesn't just surf really well on a longboard or shortboard. The best surfer can rip a old piece of junk single fin. Like the best winemaker, a lot of people can make basic red wine, but an unreal winemaker can make like a, a special glass of white wine or, you know, you know, where the real techniques start to come out or, the, you know, a high, a, a special Syrah coming out of a certain area of Paso. And you're like, whoa, I didn't even know that was capable. And here, yeah. and regardless of condition, regardless similar to surfing, you know, like, yeah. you know, I've surfed with a lot of pros, you know, in Indonesia or on surf trips and this and that. And like, you're out there and you can barely scrape a wave together and if you know kelly slater's out he makes it look like it's yes. <laughs> 10 foot pipe and it's perfect you know like you're just wondering like where are you even getting the speed from how are you doing this but that's it's a similar thing you know 
Um, it's being well-rounded. And hopefully we're getting better as we get older, but we're probably getting worse at surfing as we get older. <laughs> oh man, I really hope my peak is still ahead of me. I think it is. I think it is. Uh, Don't worry. You're only 40, dude. You're good. <laughs> that's right. And that's kind of, I've seen that, you know, over the, you know, to Phillips, you know, analogy, like even with the winemakers that have come over the last, you know, growing up here and over the last 25 years, 20 years, how much the bar has been raised and the quality of wine and the quality of grape growing in Paso. It's mm -hmm. phenomenal. And then, you know, I don't, you know, we've always known Paso is capable. 30 years ago, it wasn't, the wines were good, but it wasn't where it is today. Yeah. And that's who influences new ideas, new, you know, techniques and have raise the bar in what we didn't think was possible just like the best guy out at the crappiest wind swell day at the rock all of a sudden is mind-blowing and you're like barely scrapping for a wave and, yeah yeah and ironically that the ocean probably plays the biggest influence too for us too you know on vineyards and stuff so it's it's a nice tie-in you know it's, we're yeah. not, it's not so far-fetched chris you can you've got yeah. this 50 degree water that's the a giant air conditioner, you know, for uh, cooling off this region. So that's right. I mean, as what Pat is yeah. saying, and for everybody watching, is is that our correlation to the ocean. So our our boundaries, if you will, is limited by the San Lucia mountain range, and that mountain range basically helps to stave off overcooling influences from, say, the Pacific Ocean, especially uh, those northwesterly uh, winds that we typically get. Uh, that are just kind of like our, our regular wind. But then also it still allows a little bit of infiltration of cool air at the end of the day, on, especially our warm summer days, uh, where as hot air rises and mixes with that moist cool air, it creates this fog that rolls in and out. And when that happens, that brings in these cool ocean breezes that help to cool us off. So we have this diurnal temperature swing of about 50 degrees. And it has absolutely everything to do with the Pacific Ocean uh, that we all enjoy and uh, make it make our home, basically. So thanks, Pat, for bringing that up. Hey, Pat, well, we got you. Um, so I'm going to share the screen again. What is it that we're having here? It's, it's, it's a cab franc, and I think that's worth talking about because it comes into this whole kind of creativity and kind of different stuff out of Paso that um, is totally different than everything else we're tasting today. Yeah, yeah, this was, I mean, kind of a fun wine because, and the reason I chose it was, it was one, it's a, an example of, uh, of, of West Side Bordeaux wines that are growing out here. Um, you know, being in Willow Creek, we're, we're a region two technically, where we sit specifically, we're probably closer to a region three um, on the Winkler scale. So in, in the heat index, basically on a scale of one to five, we're pretty much right there in the middle. Um, and, uh, you know, Cab Franc being a cooler, you know, it leans on the cooler side of the Bordeaux family, but, um, but it does really well at, at our ranch. We've been growing it since uh, 2006. And, um, and it, I think it's an example of one, the ageability of, of the wine. And then two, like, you know, kind of what some of the expression is off of uh, off the Hart Hill there. So that we're, that's just off of West 46, our winery. And this uh, this block is just to the right of our iconic grove of oaks that are in the shape of a heart. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of a, a nice little variety. We, we threw a splash of Malbec in there uh, to kind of round out the edges and then uh, a little bit of Cabernet Sauvignon to add a little structure, but uh, and I think it's a, a fantastic example of Cabernet Franc. It plays a, a significant role in a lot of our Bordeaux blends. And, um, and I think it has some really nice elements of like, just like dry tannin, kind of a persistent tannin, um, you know, nice black fruits and, and, uh, and certain, certainly good ageability with uh, what we've seen. So it's, it's kind of fun. I really like this wine. <clears throat> when I opened it, I was, I, I just, I've got a soft spot for Crab Franc. Um, you guys probably don't know this, but I worked in uh, Santa Mignon at Chateau Angeles for three years. Okay. And they make, arguably, you'd be silly to argue this, but probably one of the best Cabernet Francs on the planet. I mean, you know, the right side of Bordeaux there in oh. Santa Mignon, it's just, it's incredible. So I've got 
a bit of a love affair with Cab Franc and I love the variety. And when I tasted this wine, I was like, this is really nice. It's got some primary fruit certainly still hanging on despite the fact that it's now six years old um, and complexity starting to come in. I think it's a really beautiful wine and I've got a confession to make. So um, Jess went to pick up the wines and I was just supposed to pick up a bottle of Peachy Canyon GSM on my way home from surfing at your guys' tasting room. Right. But there was another bottle of Niner Cab Franc in that bag. So oh, I yeah. took that too. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's why I'm drinking Malbec. I was like, gosh, I'm going to have to like, oh, that's all right. I tasted this so, enough. So I'm I owe you a share. bottle of wine. <laughs> <laughs> good, stuff. good stuff i saw it i looked at it i was like 14 cap front um should i say something no <laughs> <laughs> right on. i knew it was you or chris you know I was like, you, got something. <laughs> you got one for me I, i'll either let you take a, a set wave or you'll get a bottle of wine <laughs> <laughs> good stuff so uh, hey Josh, talk a little bit about the GSM then that that's in here because this is this is totally a first for you guys and and I, I'd love to hear everybody's uh, kind of opinions on this. I think it's so cool. By the way, just real quick, everyone, um, we've got a GSM from Peachy Canyon, who, as Josh was saying earlier, a bit, bit of a Zen house, but they're going GSM. Totally cool. Totally personality of Paso there. Cab Franc also. A total personality of Paso is we're also known as this Porto region, and then Syrah, and just powerful and these different expressions. Um, you gotta check out their websites and everything, and and maybe get a bottle for yourselves. But this is a really neat tasting of that that expands like this whole breadth of Paso right now. I, Super different wines. I'm gonna reuse this. I'm gonna I'm gonna redo this tasting someday. I I can I can tell you already for some trade or some media. It's, it's pretty freaking cool. Um, yeah. Josh, about that GSM. Real quick, yeah, so this, the 2018 GSM, we have five estate vineyards, and we have one in the Templeton Gap, one Willow Creek, and one, three in the Adelaide District. And the, the GSM comes from the Mustang Springs Ranch, where I'm sitting at, where the winery is. I'm kind of on the northern side of the Adelaide District. Um, about 10 years ago, my brother and I, and my dad, you know, decided we needed, we wanted to go back to our roots, to the vineyard across from you, Philip. One day I'm going to come and we're going to yell back and forth from where I grew up. Because I used to do that with the kids or that used to live where law is today. We used to, what are you doing? <laughs> um, I used to live on that hillside. I lived in that little house for a year up on the, right up, right across from the winery there. Uh, perfect. So we put in 30 acres of dry farm vineyard here 10 years ago and we wanted to do some roans like we wanted to i wanted to branch out and so we kind of built our own little roan valley here and we've got grenache syrah moved kind of all wrap around each other and you know this wine you know it's very approachable gsm it's just it just released um two months ago um 2018 it's 69 grenache 22 syrah nine moved um, very approachable, very juicy, very, not a, a real big wine, um, but I like the flavor profile. I like the Grenache face. I like the, the Grenache notes that it's bringing to the wine. And then to be able to do, you know, dry farm, right? You know, I know a lot of people assume that all West Side you can, but once you get to the Northern edge of the Adelaide district, you know, our, from where Philip is to right here, you know, being Adelaide, his rainfall to my rainfall almost cut in half, really. I mean, we're that mountain range kind of where Dow, you know, we're right over from Dow. It, it drops a lot. We get a lot less rain. So it was tough to get these up and going, but we're super happy to be able to do something different besides Zen as well, you know, to extend our portfolio. We're having a ton of fun. You know, it's a, you know, an acre or a ton, ton and a half to the acre, slow yield. That's super low, yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, all, we did it all old school, all 12 by 12, planted on a diamond. Um, yeah, it's, we're having a ton of fun with it. Real fortunate to be able to be able to bring it back to being, you know, peachy being 100% estate with the, you know, the five ranches now. In another year, we'll be able to, in our fifth one coming online, it'll be 
I'll be super stoked. Very nice. Yeah, yeah this is fantastic. I love the, it's like biting into a, a fresh raspberry, like a, the raspberry, strawberry, and then the spice elements. Like that's a, that's a, that's a perfect summer wine. Like this, I'd take this to the beach, you know, like yeah. you just, okay. uh, yeah, fresh, it's fruity, it's spicy, it's uh, got nice tannin and, and mouthfeel. So that, that's fantastic. Yeah, good. And good tension. There's great acidity, you know, that keeps it really nice. And it kind of accentuates those bright notes from the Grenache being Grenache dominant. So all those red berry characteristics and then the Syrah's got, you know, a little bit darker, a little bit funk, you know, it's got a little bit of those gamey notes. Yeah. And then that touch of Moved with all those earthy characters. It's really pretty. I like the wine a lot. Yeah. We're having a ton of success. It's fun, you know, when you, you know, I did Peachy for a lot of years and then did Chronic and now back doing Peachy again and do have done a lot of Zen over the years and to be able to change it up, you know, it's, it's exciting again. It gets, and I love doing Zen still, don't get me wrong. We have Zen at all five ranches, you know, we're definitely having fun with that, but to be able to do something that has no Zen in it is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of like what you were saying about trading out, maybe riding a twin fin for a little while, just have a little fun, reinvent, you know? And these ferments, these Rhone ferments or Bordeaux ferments compared to a Zen, you know, and, and tasting. Totally like, different. And seeing what, how different, you know, same, same cooperage, even with different, these different varietals, you know, it's, um, it's amazing what, how they affect the wines. You know, Zin, you can, you know, can be dominated so fast, but like a Syrah or even Cap Franc that has such strong varietal characteristics that will really, you can recognize compared to Zin sometimes. It's, it's nice to be able to play in that world a little bit. Yeah, okay. totally. Yeah, I mean, the wines for me up here at Law, like we've got so much power and opulence in the wines, probably because of the, you know, the elevation as well as the fact that we've get, we get pretty tiny yields as well. But I'm always amazed at how much oak I can throw at these wines and you just don't see it. Like, I mean, some of my Syrah lots, you taste a brand new barrel, like eight months into it or something, or, you know, a year, 18 months into aging in this barrel. And you just don't see the oak. And you're just wondering, like, are you, are you kidding me? They just suck it up. And it's, it's amazing. I mean, even the Grenache from the property, I, I think um, beguiling from 18 is just over 50% new oak, which is kind of a lot of new oak for a Grenache dominant wine. Mm -hmm. But you just, you don't see it. It just adds a little complexity, a little texture, a little different tannin profile and flavor, but it's never overbearing. And I, it's always, it always amazes me. You think the tiny yields though, too, is probably a lot having to do with your soil profile because it's, it's, it's pretty calcium rich over there. I mean, it's pure, pure calcareous limestone. Yeah. I mean, literally you could pick up a rock from the vineyards and draw on a chalkboard with it. You'll ruin the chalkboard, but you can definitely do it. It's, it's, and that's the other thing that I think is so amazing. You know, we've got, we all have, you know, we're in the same area, but there's so many different nooks and crannies and different terroirs, um, kind of like different surfboards too. I mean, the, our vineyards are almost pure calcareous limestone. So it's really inhospitable. The fact that we can grow anything is kind of a miracle, but it allows us to retain a lot of tension and freshness in the form of acidity in these, in the wines. But then, you know, for you at Niner, for example, like some of those vineyards that are down towards the 46, you yeah. can just see it driving by. They're richer soils. They're oh, darker cool. soil. Yeah. And that's why I think you do so well with Cabernet and Cabernet Franc and Bordeaux varieties. Mm -hmm. um, from here, from Law, you can look straight across to Dow. And it's really funny, like in the summer and in different seasons, you look across and you see their land and there's just this hint of red. You know, there's, there's iron in the soils. You can see yeah. it from here, from like miles away. And that's what makes them so, so, so successful with Bordeaux varieties and Cabernet as well, because it loves that iron rich soil. But then just a couple of hillsides over towards us that iron is gone and it's just snow white, you know? Right. So that's why for us, Rhone varieties are really interesting and, and do, I think a lot better. I mean, we do grow Cabernet as well, mm -hmm. but I utilize it as a blending grape. Um, we make a wine called Audacious that's basically pre or esque you know, 30, 35% Grenache and then equal parts Carignan and Cabernet at roughly 25% and then round it out with a touch of Syrah. 
and it just works beautifully. But I don't think that the Cabernet here is, you know, a Bordeaux Cabernet. It's more of a Priorat Cabernet or something right. like that, you know? So it's, it's really interesting how in this one ABA, this one place that we all call home, all these things are possible. I mean, we make a Tempranillo dominant wine. You know, there's like, I get to wear five different hats as far as winemaking goes, which is yeah. super fun, you know? Yeah, no, that fast change from west to east is, is quite amazing, both for soil, for temperature, for climate, for rainfall. It, it is a, a very diverse area, you know, and, and uh, that's what makes it kind of exciting and unique. And, and, and it's fun for us, I think, you know, as winemakers and knowing Josh and now Philip. And, and Chris like having the camaraderie it's like we still surf together you know you could still have that camaraderie you go down to Swami's or someplace you know down south it's packed out it's like no it's every man for himself it's not mm -hmm. uh, you know that kind of friendliness and so it, it's nice to have you know a, a closer-knit community that does share information yeah. and ideas and stuff like that so yeah, it's kind of almost like even though not necessarily everybody is a surfer in this town, but when it comes to a lot of the winemakers anyway, the camaraderie that winemakers share is a lot of the same kind of Central Coast camaraderie that that we all share. I mean, we got on <clears throat> on this thing, and I think the first question we all asked each other was, did you get in the water? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think right. this first question all of us ask anyway, no matter what. We'll have to weave in one of our surf stories, each one of us, you know, whether it's worst injury or most exotic place or, you Yeah, know. that'd be fun. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do both. <laughs> <clears throat> hey, so <clears throat> even though, Philip, you were just talking, I do want uh, you guys, being Josh and, and, and Pat, talk a little bit about the law wine actually and what you're finding oh, yeah. that I I, yeah, I I said powerful when I was talking a little bit about the wines but powerful and elegant and and you know yet still with this interesting kind of bright little acidity in the background that just absolutely heightens a, a lot of that kind of bold brashness of Syrah that wants to be like kind of in your face the Grenache is just kind of smoothing it out and taming it it's 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 a it's a very pretty wine, yeah. Thank you. It is, and I you know I I love the true you know even though it does have a little bit of Grenache, the true it does have a lot of still varietal character in that Syrah. And I don't know if a lot of, I don't know if you did both the Syrah and the Grenache in concrete or if it was a co-ferment concrete. But I love for me fermenting in concrete it keeps it that cool nice slow ferment so you don't lose anything you don't burn anything off you have a nice yeah. you know it really I, that's one thing i always go to like it allows me to maintain the varietal and then trying to i mean it's that blueberry and those dark berried fruits that syrah has they come right through and the power is there but like you said the elegance but then i enjoy the little bit of age but it's a it's an age that still is not it hasn't lost anything. It's just kind of just come around more. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, cool. Yeah. I, I agree. I mean, this, this wine is like the hallmarks for great wines are wines that evolve and they just continue to unfold in front of you. And this is, this is a wine that, that is showing those characteristics. It's like, you know, you have this little anise and, and nice quality to it. And then underlying there's the warm oak tones. Um, but what I've most appreciated, I opened this uh, about an hour ago because I knew I was like, I bet this wine is gonna, it needs time, is gonna yeah. unfold. And so I've been watching it for you know about an hour now, and and it really has. I mean, it just continues to evolve. It continues to change. Like in in human years, it's probably twenty years old. You know, it's it's still got a lot of life in it, and um, and will we'll, I'm sure mature beautifully. So I'll, I'm gonna enjoy this over the next couple of days. That's always yeah. what I, I like to do with a, a nice wine like. Uh, that yeah. has good aging uh, qualities and and i'll drink this over the next two three days if i can keep it away from my wife and uh, <laughs> and, and just go for it <laughs> fruit is yeah. just because if I, if I duck you know you gotta know what <laughs> that this was 63 percent new i'd be like yeah right like no way that's like, what i was saying earlier right? yeah it's 63 yeah. percent new oak on that one and 
since it's mainly Syrah, that New York portion is mainly barrels because I we age the Syrah in barrels, Burgundy barrels, so 228s. And the impact of New Oak there is much greater than a puncheon at 500 liters. So I'd say out of those 60 odd percent New Oak, at least like 95% of that is barrels. Um, so, and pretty high impact barrels. I like Francois Freya and Hermitage and Gillet and, um, yeah. and Rousseau barrels for the Syrah. So they're not, you know, soft barrels. They're pretty high impact and it's, it just eats it up. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. Yesterday when on our practice session where I said, I mentioned the word barrels and Pat instantly is like barrels. Oh, I want to get barreled. <laughs> <laughs> like no man yep. barrels <laughs> always always trying to hunt those down <laughs> yep. trying to get pretty elusive beer. sometimes on the central coast you got to get lucky it is. yeah 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 it's funny i went to school at, in santa barbara i was at uc santa barbara i studied microbiology but i was there four years probably again no offense to my wife but some of the best years as far as the undomesticated years um <laughs> it was uh you know, putting wet seats on in your dorm room and running out to the point and, you know, and then running to class and, and doing that for, for four years and, and um, surfing all the right point breaks there in Santa Barbara is, uh, is, is pretty, is pretty awesome. A different oh. world from Central Coast, but. Uh, it is, but it's so close. I mean, yeah. I make it down to Surf Rink on at least three or four times a year. Whenever it's on, it's one hour, well. If you're speeding, it's just under two hours, right? So <laughs> that's right. you're there like that. Yeah, it's it's no, pretty that's cool. True. So yeah, it's too busy then, for my blood, man. That's the thing. That's what I was going to mention. That's what makes the Central Coast so appealing to me as a surfer is the crowds or lack hey, thereof. Yeah, don't, come on, we're talking to surfers. <laughs> don't tell anybody. <laughs> I don't know who's watching. Sorry. Advertising. <laughs> well, we've got lots of really big fish. And really cold water. Yeah. I think that, that keeps <laughs> we do. Away. This is, we do. That's and that's not embellishing the truth at all. We do have really big fish here. <laughs> yeah, I actually just this would have been like just over three weeks ago, the weekend before my son was born. Um, I surfed hazards and it was really fun. Um, and I came in and literally 15 minutes later, a friend of mine came in as I was changing and he's like been surfing here my whole life i've never seen that before i was like what and he's like solid eight foot great white just went mm -hmm. right underneath me on my way back out yeah. but the funny thing is he paddled back out <laughs> he talked to all the people out in the water he's like oh dude, i just saw a big great white and they're like you sure it's like yeah like clear yeah. as day right underneath me i mean big it's eight foot that's a juvenile really but most dangerous no one went in everyone just stayed out yeah, that's, that's when you count how many people are out and you go, all right, my odds, one in 15. All right, I'm good. Yeah, I'm uh, good. I'm good. I can do this. I think I'll stay out a couple more ways. <laughs> yeah. Well, Josh, you've been serving here pretty much all your life. You, I mean, they, they're here. Yeah. They, yeah, they, yeah, no doubt. And they're definitely, you know, even... When I was a kid, you know, I used to sleep on under the bridge at Arroyo Laguna my whole, you know, before I could drive, my mom would drop me off over there and my two buddies and we'd stay all weekend to drop us off Friday after school, pick us up Sunday night. And, but that was before the sea, the elephant seal colonies moved down, you know, and it was, it didn't seem as bad. Obviously, as I've gotten older, I've just have not been as much denial as I was as a kid. Um, yeah. Yeah, they're definitely here. The hardest part now is that having kids that surf and, you know, and I get a wave if I'm surfing with them and I'm far away and, you know, and there's that moment, like there's nothing I can do right now. You know, if something happens, they're far out there, way down the beach or whatever. And that still gets me a little bit, a little bit eerie. Yeah. And like, you know, as I, for some reason, I, I didn't mind, used to mind surfing alone as much, but now as I've gotten older, I've like, I try to kind of look for somebody early in the morning. Like, it's hey, eerie. Anybody? I don't like surfing here by myself. It's just, you need one other guy, you know, that's at least you rock up alone and it's perfect. You're kind of like, yes, no, <laughs> come on, somebody. <laughs> yeah. When we moved here, my wife made me promise I wouldn't surf by myself anymore because I think we were here a month and somebody got snapped and it's like, <sighs> yeah, I had to make the same promise to my wife and my mom. 
<laughs> I broke it once or twice, but I still see my buddy Kevin Swanson, who got hit at, at Sandspit a couple of years ago, and I saw him last weekend out. My like, if Kevin's out, then I have nothing to worry about. I, well, right. What are the odds for him getting bit twice? So <laughs> hang out right next to him. You know, that's right. That's right. I don't know if you guys know Kyle Knapp down at Stoltman, but he's a buddy, and yeah, but I'm out. <laughs> It's crazy, yeah. Yeah, hey, we, got a, we have a question, by the way. Um, so, Philip, for you, the barrel types, could you rattle those off one more time? Um, uh, well, I actually, um, I work with 11 different cooperages, um, probably because 11 is my lucky number. Oh, I don't know, that's probably a lie. But um, it, it really depends on the varieties that I work with. So I've got different barrels that I like to use for different varieties. And for me, my philosophy is really, you know, the more I understand the vineyards, the more I understand the blocks and the different clones of Syrah and the different aspects that we have uh, in the vineyards, I'm really trying hard every single year to match the cooperages that I think match those varieties or those clones best. So, you know, if I take notes on these wines every single year, and every single year, clone 470 Syrah, I prefer Hermitage to Dami. I'm going to stop using Dami eventually, you know? So I'm really trying to fine tune those cooperages that I really think match the varieties and, and clones um, best. But um, for me, the, the biggest ones I'd say are um, Bouc, uh, Rousseau, Hermitage, Francois Frère. And then for the Bordeaux program, I use exclusively Tarasso. Sylvan and Danajou. And then um, I use a little bit of Dami, a little bit of Gilet. Who am I missing? Atelier. I like a little bit of Atelier. But it's funny. Um, I love their barrels, and I, but you know, Atelier is known for producing really light impact barrels. They're known for steam bending, and you know, the house blend is really kind of a light toast. Um, and it's weird, I'm, I'm probably the only person that does this, but I order Tronce specific forest barrels from them, which is completely outside of their portfolio, fire bent, heavy toast. So they probably look at me every year and go like, this isn't what we're all about. But I'm like, well, that's the barrels that I like from you. So there you go. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's pretty much the ones that I work with mainly. So we have another question from Facebook for the three of you is um, most recent board purchase and why? Mm. <laughs> Surfing one. Oh, oh, I'll start because I just did it. So I nice. had a full hip replacement in December and I was just like, just, wow. it, it went, it was all bitching, but of course there's a long time of rehab and getting pumped up and watching surf videos and this and that. and. I needed something to keep me motivated in the end. And the, so I kept seeing on the new CI, this new, the new fish beef, this new twin fin that, and I have Shane Stoneman, you know, his uh, stonefish, which I love, you know, it's a great yeah. board. I ride that thing probably too much, but I kept seeing the fish beard and I was like, God, that, it just had this little bit of high performance look to it, but still the fish. And so I went and got one actually like a month and a, from I actually waited for my birthday. I was like, ah, this is my birthday present. Sweet. Um, but the new CI fish beard, uh, first board I've ever had to buy. I've always, I've never, or I can't say never, but I haven't bought a board off the rack in 20 years. And it was the first time I had to go in and do the whole, you know, arm feel like, yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. I have never bought boards on leaders, so I wasn't into the whole leader movement yet. But now I've, and luckily the actually the arm feel worked, and I was right in there and like, perfect hit the nails. And I go, okay, this is, this this thirty liters works for me at a five nine, blah blah blah. Okay, I'm in. But the twin fin fish beard, it's got nice high performance, but it's got a lot of volume up front in the chest to catch waves and get going. And well, that's my most recent purchase. I'm pretty proud. Right on. Cool. I keep I keep thinking that with that whole leader new leader movement I should just have the leaders match my age. <laughs> you can do that. There's like uh, Matt Violas, Lost Surfboards, and all the, like they all have 
leaderage calculators. You put in your size, your weight, your skill level, your age, everything. And it basically spits out like roundabout, you know? And for me, it's, I'm always, I live between 26 and 27 liters, basically. That's, I love those. I mean, once you get into step ups and mini guns and stuff like that, the leaderage increases because you need a little more, you know, volume under your chest. But 26 and a half liters for me is just money for short boards, standard short boards. That's just, seems to be perfect. That's a potato chip. So what, <laughs> what board did you just get most recently? Um, so my most recent board is I actually, I had um, CI also custom make um, a rocket wide for me. So it's actually kind of similar to the fish beard. Um, it's a little bit more of a pulled in swallow tail. So it's a little bit more high performance than the fish beard, I think, but it's also kind of like, I wanted to get it for those, you know, not necessarily just the groveling days, because I find that that board actually goes really well when it's even overhead and, and pretty hollow, but it's kind of more of a small wave board. But ironically, I ride it as a, a twin plus one. I have two wow. big old twin fins on either side and a little trailer in the back. Mm -hmm. And that just, that's, you know, that, that variation. You know, like I've been used to writing thrusters for so long. I love quads too. So I, I usually get five boxes so I, I can go from thruster to quad or, or back and forth. But it was just so invigorating to try this board with a twin plus one. I mean, the pivot just gets cut in half. You know, what would take me, you know, an effort to get up the face and I could do the same move in like, five feet further up. Like, it's amazing. I drop in and the second I pivot off the bottom, I mean, it just goes vertical right away because those two big fins just have all that turning and all that drive power. And there's nothing in the back to hold it in. Just that little like trailer, you know? So it just, it's, it's so much fun. I had it, I had them glass it a little bit heavier. Um, I'm not exactly an air guy. Um, so, but and it doesn't, you know, it I doesn't don't care if there's out, extra two ounces of glass on the deck. It just makes my boards <laughs> live longer. Huh? What was that? It doesn't, it doesn't slide out. Does it make like corner bottom turns? Like it feel like the, the, the back end kicks out a little bit. It doesn't. It, it no, holds nice. pretty well. It holds really well. I mean, oh, if I surfed tail, it in it? Indo and it was over four or five foot, I'm pretty yeah. sure I'd be wanting a, a bigger center fin, but right. You know, for your typical California waves that are a little bit more slopey and not so, you know, top to bottom, it's just yeah. so much fun. Nice. So I've been really enjoying that. I got that uh, in, what is it? It's a five, six. I can't remember all the dimensions, but it's just over, it's 27 liters. So it's one of my bigger volume boards. So I'm going to, I'm going to interrupt you really quick here because we yeah. are starting to run uh, a little low on time here, but I will say though is, is that um, you can see how detailed they get about board <laughs> and Pat still has to talk, but they get detailed about boards. Imagine how detailed they are about lines, right? And, you know, pick times and pH and bricks and all of those types of things. Anything with numbers, we're typically obsessed with it. Pat, uh, you want to chime in and then I am going to end it with a little thing about uh, opening. We had somebody ask about opening and, and how that's really yeah, so real quick, this, I'm going to talk about actually my my glory purchase because uh, unlike you guys, I blew out a couple discs surfing a left spot up in Montana de Oro a few years ago. So I had to I move into the longer boards, although every once in a while I'll break out this that old thing that sits on the corner there and, and nice. you know, it's still got wax on it, you know, it, it got brought out this year and uh, some winter winter stuff but um but no i bought a longboard on craigslist for 400 bucks the walden 9496 magic model and i surfed it in a contest and won 500 bucks that weekend on my 40th birthday so that was my like my glory nice. that's like nice. the best board purchase i'd ever made in my life because it's like it just uh, paid for that, itself plus 100 bucks <laughs> no, that's, that's so rad, it's, it's dude. Fun. very cool um, <laughs> But no, that, you know, every, every once in a while I'll test my back and ride that, that big thing every now and then and, and, uh, you know, see how I did. But, uh, 
I thought that was the best story. Well, we cool. are getting up to the end here, if you can believe it or not. Um, somebody had a question about reopening. I will say real quickly that the county uh, just announced uh, today that we are in stage two. And what that means is, is that wineries who um, basically have well, existing food service, though. So like literally like food that you're served at a table, you're having lunch or something of that sort, um, you are eligible to open because it's, I think the assumption is, is that there's some physical distancing and, and all of that. There are a lot of stipulations and a lot of protocols, of course, it's not just that easy, but it's that basic thing that if you're a winery and you're serving food, that then you can reopen in this stage that we have now entered. Um, I will say though that a lot of wineries are starting to, to look at how they can be creative and potentially be contracting with an outside vendor because that is also um, approved as a part of this stage two opening. Uh, we being the Wine Alliance are still trying to get some clarification though on what is food? What is not what is food? We know what food is, but what is uh, the actual like kind of food service thing? Is it a cheese tray? Uh, does that constitute, or you know, a hot dog, or how, you know, how does that work? And so we're still working on that to be able to provide clarity to our wineries. We're talking to Wine Institute, we're talking to the county and the state health departments, and we're talking to the state, of course, and the governor's office, in order to be able to really find clarity for that. So that way we know that we're giving them the best information and that they have the best information moving forward in this opening process. So I hope that answers uh, the question. Um, guys, thanks so much. Uh, it's, it's been a fun little conversation. Uh, I totally dig this kind of stuff. I wish I could maybe, you know, incorporate this all the time. Uh, there's a quick clip of, of the wave from earlier today. Uh, nice. it was actually pretty fun. Uh, <laughs> there's that left hander that I got, I think I got one of those. I think Phil did. I think, I think your buddy Quinn did too. And, uh, it was, it was pretty good. So. Right on, you guys. Thanks so much for being being part of this hangout. I really appreciate it. Cheers. Right on. See ya. See you in the water. See you guys. Later. Cheers.